Dave used to come up very often and say, have us repeat after him. He'd hold up that yellow notepad, you know. Oh, no, the dreaded yellow pad. Well, sometimes when I come, he has me bring, I, could, I should hold this up and say, you could say, oh, no, the dreaded white document, you know. <laughs> and uh, things are changing, how he's having me even minister is changing. And uh, this is hot off the wire, got it this morning. Actually, I think I got it this week, praying all those hours in tongues, just praying the mysteries. And at the time, it seems boring and like nothing's going on. But you have to do it by faith, trusting that God knows what he's doing and that every hour that you give him praying in tongues, he is communicating the mysteries of the gospel to your spirit. And Well, what mysteries? And Dave would tell us everything Christ is in you, to you. Today's message, through you. Through you. Because we're, we're headed to revival, a real revival, not the kind you schedule, you know, by man's appointment and that type of thing, but a supernatural outpouring where when they bring the blind, the lame, the halt, the crippled, they receive their healing, say it with me, first time, every time, no exceptions. And that's the way he did it. That's the way he's going to do it through us because he has not changed. My Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. So he's not going to change his mind about where, what revival looks like. So let's not try and change it on earth, okay? So that's what we're pressing toward. Now, I think last week uh, the title was something like, because something he said to Sue, <laughs> you know, okay, I won't leave it out. What he said was, I know, but before that he said, return with me now. To those thrilling days of yesteryear. And, and those of us that have been around a while remember that's from uh, the Lone Ranger. And uh, see, God, people think God doesn't have a sense of humor. Oh, yeah, he does, too. Yeah, he, if, if you'll let him, he'll, he'll, he'll play with you some, you know. I will remind you again, one time something similar like that happened to me. I, was, I thought I was having a heart attack, and I, I knew it could be heartburn, but it... And I'd had those before, and, and so I was just sitting in the, I was up out of bed because I was miserable and hurting. But this one just kept getting worse and worse. I, I, after an hour or so, I was thinking, I'm, I'm wondering if I should go to the ER, you know. But I might be having a heart attack. And right about then, the Lord said, now he said, it to, he could have just said, go get some Alka-Seltzer. But he, this is what I heard. I'm listening with all I can on the inside, and here's what I heard. Plop, plop. Fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. And I went, Alka-Seltzer? <laughs> and we didn't have any. I wound up having to drive to the Walgreens all night, Walgreens, and get some Alka-Seltzer. Sure enough, I took it. In about 15 minutes, it was gone. I was back to normal. Now, don't tell me he won't play with you a little bit. He could have just said, go get some Alka-Seltzer, you know. But as Sue, he said, return with me now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. And that got Sue's attention, you know, of course. And then he said... Rewind so that I can fast forward. Well, I'm not Sue and I have talked that over. You know, what does that mean to you and what does it mean to you? And we both believe that he's saying, uh, we've all been at this a while. Most, uh, maybe, maybe you're new, but most of us here have been at this a spell. And he was like, go back now through all of those things that I've spoken with you, taught you, communicated with you over these years. Get them fresh in your memory again. Review them. Speak them. And, and then he says, as you do that, as you rewind, in other words, go back. Of course, rewind for us of the cassette era, we remember rewind, right? If you want to hear it again, what do you do? You got to rewind. You don't have to do that now, but we did then. So we've been doing that, going back all the way to the early, early days, still in the truck days for me, before I even left the trucks. It's, I, I'd forgotten some of the things that he said there. And so I've been going through those and reading them again and saying them out loud again, doing my part to the rewind. Well, one of the things that he said in there, which is pertinent to today's lesson, he said in there, the mystery, excuse me, the anointing is no mystery to him. Uh, Jane, see the ball, okay? <laughs> the mystery is, excuse me, the anointing is no mystery to him. Then he said, I will make it no mystery to you if you will sit at the feet of my teacher and let him teach you how to let it flow through you. 
Another time, the Holy Spirit says, I am the anointing. Notice how it says in the word that Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. It's Acts 10, 38. So this morning, and again, okay, I'm just... I don't think I brought, uh, when I come to prayer, and I'm still doing it here, and I'm trying to duplicate here at home. Now, I wasn't here Friday. No, excuse me, I wasn't here Saturday, and there's a, a reason. But I was here, when, but I did the same praying at home. Actually, I got in more hours. You know, we do 7 to 12. Well, I started at 5.30 and went to 12. Now, why am I saying that? It's to encourage you during those boring times, because I'm telling you, Wednesday, I was down here from 4 to 8 o'clock. That's you know, four hours. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. I waved at Phil. I waved. At, <laughs> you know, somebody comes by and talk. Oh, God, yes, talk to me for just a minute. No, no, not too long. You know, i got to get back to prayer. But, I mean, it's boring. It seems like nothing is happening. You're just praying, 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 praying. And then I came down Friday from noon to 8. Now, that's a spell. I did leave for about 30 minutes to go to Starbucks to get one cup of coffee. Give, give the flesh a bone here. Have your, have your Starbucks, you know. Come back. So it's a, good, a good seven and a half hours. Didn't, as far as I could tell, I never, I never pulled my computer out of my bag. I didn't type nothing. 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 <laughs> Saturday morning, Friday at home, 5.30 till noon. That's a spell. Do you get bored during that time, Gary? Well, do you? <laughs> Come on, it's as dry as cracker juice, as Dave would say. I don't, there's no feeling, there's no anointing, there's, you know, you read, you can do, th you can read the Bible. I did watch, uh, during that time, I prayed while I watched Alan's most recent message that he posted on, if you're not watching those, talking about the seed, oh, they are, they are superb. It's, you know, excellent. Where do you think I get my stuff? No, anyway. <laughs> but they are excellent. They really are. And, and he's doing it in, He's really doing it in a, starting at a very basic level. It's really good. And for people that aren't familiar with our terminology, oh, it's so line upon line. Anyway, enough bragging on Alan. Oh, yeah, he's probably over there going, come on. You know, no, no, he's not. He's not. I'm teasing. But I did watch that. And, uh, but then, you know, that only lasts, what was it, 50 minutes, I think. Then it's back to, oh, Sunday, la buckle, Sunday. Now, I was still praying while I watched it, don't get me wrong, but now it's back to the, your mind has got nothing to do. Well, but see, then all of a sudden, and you never know when it's coming. And uh, I, I woke up this morning, and the class was already in session. I had to get out of bed, get to my living room, and begin get that little laptop out, and I began typing and typing and typing. And... Uh, I'm going to deliver that to you. It's pretty, it's fairly short, but uh, by the way, let me go ahead. I want you to see three verses. So you're going to have to put three markers in your Bible. I don't know how you do that with a glass phone, with a glass Bible. <laughs> on, but anyway, write them down or something. But we're going to go to these in, because uh, you need to see the way he showed it to me. But it's John 15, 5, Acts 7, no, excuse me. I am so sorry. John 15, 5. Then John 7, starting in verse 38. Then Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Hallelujah. Still training my eyes, but sometimes they're resisting. So better to actually read what's on the page. <laughs> Yes, so he was been re rewinding and going through all of those things that he uh, said. It's a lot of things for us. I mean, it's a lot. And one of the things that, that really jumped out at me again was, he said, we are, going, we are going to look back from a future date and just laugh that we ever thought the miracles were so hard. Or, or let's say it another, the, the healings were so hard, or walking in the anointing was so hard. We're going to just look back and laugh at like, how could we have ever been like that, you know? Well, this lesson today is going to go a ways towards that. 
I've never seen it like this. Uh, well, I've, we've all seen through a glass darkly. We all see parts of the puzzle, but he's clearing it up. See, he's wiping the fog off the glass. Can I say it that way? <laughs> all right. So let's go ahead and get into it. The title of today's, I happen to know this time, it's The Vine and the Flow. The Vine and the Flow. So we're going to start off in John 15, 5. <clears throat> I am the vine, ye, you, are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. All right. Now this time, as I read it, one word stood up on the page. You know what I mean by that? The Holy Spirit will draw your attention really strong. And it was vine. The word vine. I am the vine. Okay? Now let's go to the next one. John 7, 38. And actually we're going to do 38 and 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly. Now he does not mean your stomach. He's talking about your inner core. Out of the center of your being. What's he talking about? Your spirit. Okay. Out of your belly shall flow. Now that's the word in this one. Flow. Stood up off the page. The vine and the flow. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow. Well, what's going to flow? Rivers of living water. But look at verse 39. He gets more specific. But this spake he of the Spirit, capital S, and it should be capital S, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So when he says, out of your, out of your spirit is going to flow rivers of living water, you could just as well say, out of your spirit, it may seem odd at first, it's going to be okay. Out of your spirit will flow rivers of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost himself. At this point, my brain, like your brain, was leaking out my right ear. <laughs> out of my spirit will flow. Okay. All right, let's go a little more here. Now go to Acts 2.17. So again... In John 15, 5, the word that stood out was vine. In John 7, 38, the word was flow. All right. In Acts 2, 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. Now, this is really Joel's prophecy that Peter is repeating. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will... Pour. Now, that's the word in this one that stood up off the page. So we got vine, flow, and pour. Okay? I will pour out of my spirit. Now, whose spirit? What spirit is that? That's the Holy Spirit. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I'm still having visions. I'm also having dreams. I'm young and old. <laughs> hmm. Now, one more verse before we really get into it, because you're, you're close. Go, come on down to Acts 2.22. Got some more, a few more words that stood up off the page to me. But it's, you can't put them all in the title. It would be too long. <laughs> Acts 2.22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. This is where it starts. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop where the words didn't, where they stopped standing up off the page. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. See, every time that he refers to Jesus that way, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, don't write me any letters. I know Jesus is God in the flesh. I understand that. I know he is deity, okay? But he laid down his deity 
to totally operate on planet Earth as a man anointed with the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, how could he be our pattern? If he did anything as God, that we're excluded. Okay? But that's why it's drawing our attention here. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. And if you want to even get, I looked it up just to make sure. That's the same Greek word man that you would apply to Peter, James, anybody. You, male or female. Mankind. Okay? Most often it's referred to a male when that word is used. But sometimes it's used for mankind. Well, doesn't that include everybody? Okay. So the first part is, hear these words. Now he's drawn our attention to somebody. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. You got that part? Approved of God among you. Well, how did God approve of him? Why did, how did God show his approval? By miracles and wonders and signs. Now, the next few words that stood up off the page. First, it was which God did. That's, that's what stood up first. And so I'm writing, making notes. Which God did. Now, it's a man. This man's been approved of God. And these miracles, signs, wonders, and signs, God did. And after I wrote that down, then the next two words stood up. By him. And then I thought, a man. A man. Which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. So I wrote this paragraph. Now, many of these, I'm just going to read the paragraph, because I cannot improve on it. Okay. <laughs> if he lets me expound, great. Otherwise, we'll go home early. I'm not in charge anymore. Never, never did try to be. All right. I'm hearing this. Now keep this in your mind. Jesus is the vine. The Father pours His Spirit. But out of you, His Spirit flows. Did you get that? What did he say? I will pour. Jesus says, I am the vine. So he's pouring into this vine that flows through you. But it's through you, out of your spirit, out of your belly, flows rivers, not a trickle, of the Holy Ghost. And it's not just tongues. It begins with tongues. Everybody, when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, first thing's tongues. But it eventually is going to be miracles, wonders, signs. And that eventually is getting really close. So let me read this paragraph now. During Jesus' time on earth, the spirit of life in him that he had from the Father, that life, he was the vine. Finally, the Father had a connection, a vine. I'm going to stay with connection. If you'll allow me, almost like the Father in heaven could take a big funnel <laughs> and pour his Holy Spirit into this funnel that went through this spirit within the man. But from that man, through that man, through his spirit, from his belly, flowed rivers of the Holy Ghost. So I'm going to read it exactly like I wrote it. During Jesus' time on earth, the spirit of life in Christ was the vine. He was the only vine. Through whom... No, okay, I'm going to read it just like I wrote it. <laughs> Try not to add anything to it. During Jesus' time on earth, the spirit of life in Christ was the vine through whom the Father could pour forth his Holy Spirit so that the fruit of God could flow into the earth through miracles, wonders, and signs. That's hard to improve on right there. Now notice the precise wording. The miracles which God did by him, a man, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the question arises.
did God love the blind people before Jesus was on the scene? Did God want to heal people before Jesus was on the scene? Is God love? Did he only become love after Jesus was born? No, he's always the same. Isn't that right? He's always the same. He loved people before. He wanted to save people before. He wanted to heal people before. He wanted to open blind eyes before. Why didn't he? God in his sovereignty. See, people misuse the sovereignty of God. This is the proper application of the sovereignty of God. God sovereignly chose to make man ruler over this earth. He chose to have man, let man have dominion. He did that with the first Adam. Recently, and I'm going to get into it a little bit again today. We, uh, what was the title of that? Adam's high treason. Adam's high treason. It's how Satan became the God of this world. God, God does not change his words once he speaks them. He swears to his own hurt and changes not. He gave man authority. Adam committed high treason, switched his allegiance, if you'll allow me, to the devil through that fallen nature that came into him, and I'm getting ahead of myself. That's how Satan wound up, how his deeds are accomplished in the earth. But as long as that first Adam was alive, God cannot take back the dominion that he gave him because God swears to his own hurt and changes not. As long as that Adam was alive... God gave him dominion. He can't take it back. Now, the first Adam literally died, but we're talking about the whole species of Adam. As long as that Adam, all Adam, <laughs> the whole species of Adam, as long as Adam, because that was God's original plan, that the whole species would have dominion. Hmm. Got a boatload right there that we can't teach today. <laughs> hmm. Help me get back, Jesus. <laughs> Good God, Lord, man. Took a rocket, rocket ship right there. Good God, so as long as that first Adam was alive, see, Satan thought he had God in a box. I love how Dave said it. I never heard anybody say it like this before Dave. A Savior cannot come from a spiritually dead gene pool. Satan thought he had God in a box because every man born, redemption had to come through a man. And every man born was already born with a sin nature. You can't get a savior out of that gene pool. They've all got a sin nature, all of them. They can't be the savior. They're as flawed as everybody else. But Satan in his wildest dreams, never he's just not smart like God, you know. He never dreamed that God would send his son and become a man, but a righteous man. A man who'd never sinned. That would become the spotless lamb of God. Swallow up all, all of our sin and all of the sin of Adam into himself. And die on that cross as Adam. Now see, the preview of that was the day that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. He wouldn't literally go to the cross for about three more years. But God looked on his heart that day. And when John laid Jesus down in the water, that's a type of the grave. God looked on the heart of Jesus and said, it is done. Just like he looked on the heart of Abraham back there when Abraham was going to plunge the knife into Isaac and God looked on his heart and said, it's done. Don't, don't, you don't have to do it right now. I take it as done and give him a, a ram to offer instead. God looked on the heart of Jesus and it was done. And when he raised up out of the water, for, as far as God's concerned, this, that's why he declares, this is my beloved son. That is the crowning of the last Adam. And that's why the Holy Spirit came with dominion on him right then. The first Adam is dead. Long live the last Adam. And he will long live <laughs> for all eternity. The last Adam lives. But still, even though you're the last Adam. Yes, sir. I, he, he said, read, don't talk. <laughs> Y'all don't know what's going on in here. I'm telling you. You don't know what plop, plop, fizz, fizzes are happening in here. I took a rocket ship somewhere a while ago. That one sentence. I got to go back and hear that myself. 
God needed the, so why, so all of that was an answer, leading up, answer to the question, why didn't God do the works before? Jesus of Nazareth came on, the, the man, Jesus of Nazareth came on the scene, anointed by the Holy Ghost. Why didn't he, God loves the blind, he wanted to heal the blind before. See, the, got in. the law and the prophets were until John. Specifically, the day that Jesus was baptized by John. That is the crowning, spiritually, of the last Adam. That's why from that day, since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. Because the king is on the scene. You got that? The king is here. The first Adam is dead. The last Adam now is on the scene. God already counted it as done. And that's why from that point on, he is anointed with the dominion of the Holy Spirit. Now, why didn't God do it before? Because God needed the authority of man in the flesh. Because he sovereignly decided, God chose this, and he will not change it, that man shall have dominion on this earth. Now, while Jesus had his own body, we see it real clear. He's got a body from Mary. He's got a body that can be traced all the way back to Adam, which you can trace back to the dirt. So he's got, a, he's got a body from this earth, and he had authority here to do the works as the last Adam. Glory to God. Jesus himself, he, while he was on planet earth himself, he had a flesh body of authority. His spirit was the connection with the Father. And through that spirit, the Father could pour his spirit through, through this. Out of Jesus' belly, can I say it that way, flowed miracles, signs, wonders, healings. The Father is doing the works because he's got a man, a body, with authority that he can flow through unhindered. The works of the Father Jesus did because his spirit was divine. Which the Father, here's the three words. His spirit was divine, which the Father could pour the Holy Spirit to flow into the earth to manifest his works. Now, this section, I'm going to go back a little bit to a teaching. See, I can see the progression of these teachings line on line. We're going to go back a few weeks now. I don't know how many weeks to uh, really a por portion from uh, Adam's high treason. And it started, that started off with John 8, 41. Jesus was talking to the religious leaders of the day. See, it doesn't matter how religious you are. He, he, he talked to the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, in the temple, by the way. John 8, 41, You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Then he says to them in verse 44, You are of your father the devil. In the temple, publicly, with all the people there, now notice, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now in this passage right here, Jesus just mentions two, he calls them deeds of the devil. Deeds. You could just as well say the works. The works of the devil. He just mentions here murder and lies. But notice he uses that word lusts. You are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father. That word was drawing my attention this morning, so I looked it up. In Strong's, it's G1939. It's pronounced like it matters, epithumia. Now get this. It is a longing, especially, now get this, for what is forbidden. Does that remind you of anything in Genesis? From the beginning, the devil wanted man 
to partake of the forbidden fruit. <laughs> well, what fruit does Satan produce here? Well, he mentioned two of them. Murders and lies. When man did partake of the forbidden tree at that instant, you know, God says in the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. At that instant, his spirit was disconnected from the life of God. And his spirit was reconnected, if you like, or connected to the lusts of the devil instead. So what if I said it this way? The nature of fallen mankind became sin. And through the spirit in fallen man, now get this, the devil poured his lusts through the fallen nature of man so the forbidden fruit of murders and lies could be accomplished in the earth. What if I said it this way? The devil's talking now, not God. Ah, now that I have mankind, I will pour my lust out of my own spirit upon fallen man, and out of his belly will flow murders and lies. Can you see it? This is how Satan became the god of this world. Alan was talking on a recent, I think that recent message, the first time Harrison ever told him his lie. Harrison is his son. And I loved how he, he told it. He said, Harrison had done something wrong, and Alan knew he did it wrong. But this was the first time, and, and so Alan's asking Harrison. He says, did you do that? And he says, almost like Harrison, you could see his mind, little mind working. He discovered something nobody else knew. I don't have to admit it. I can say I didn't do it. And as far as Alan knows, this is the first time that Harrison ever told a lie. And he says, no. <laughs> you ever watch those America's Funniest videos where the little kids got chocolate all around his mouth? Did you get into the cookie jar? No. <laughs> it's cute, but it's still devilish. <laughs> Sorry, it's still lies. <laughs> so, of course... Alan wasn't taken in by that, and he already knew. So he straightened him out and got Harrison to admit the truth and so forth. But see, Alan makes the same statement that I, I saw it in all three of my beloved daughters. No parent ever that I know of teaches their child to lie. But eventually every child does. Where does that come from? They're cute. They're cuddly. We love them. We'll defend them with our life. But they are of their father, the devil. Sorry. All of mankind is. Now again, I'm going to add this for people that maybe have never heard this. And Alan did it too. We believe that little babies, up through the age of innocence, wherever that, it's different for different people, but until they know right from wrong, we believe God in his mercy receives every child like that that's never been able to receive Jesus. They go to heaven and they get born again there. We're not told exactly how that happens, but... The God of the whole earth will do that which is right. And the, any little baby that's killed in a car wreck or a fire or abortion, they grow up in heaven. Don't worry. They're, they're okay. That's a teaching for another time, but don't worry. Okay? If you lost a child when they're really young before the age of accountability, they're not in hell. All right. I'm going to read that sentence again. So the devil talking now, this is, see, the devil can't create anything. He only counterfeits what God does. So you could say for fallen man, he'd say, well, now that I have man, man bowed the knee to me. Adam did it. So I've got them all. I will pour lust, my lust, out of my spirit upon fallen man and out of his belly through his fallen spirit will flow murders and lies. Now. Man's flesh is the authority through which murders and lies are accomplished. You remember Dave teaching us all the way back there in Genesis when he told the serpent of the earth, you'll eat the dust? What was really going on there, that's where God stripped much of Satan's archangel ability. Satan can't just walk. If Satan could just walk up and kill you, don't you think he'd have killed B a long time ago? 
<laughs> he he would just wipe he could just wipe anybody out. He just you know he doesn't have that ability. He can't just murder. He has to get Phil to go murder. <laughs> what I mean, uh, Mark. I mean, uh, Gary. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> he he has to get me to do it. Isn't that right? Even a, you say, well, what about a car wreck? Well, most most of the time, they're <laughs> inebriated or high. Or too sleepy. Or distracted. They still got to get a human somehow involved. Most of the time. Or the guy that fixed the flat tire didn't fix it right and it blows out. I mean, it's all, there's got to be some correlation there with authority on the earth. So I'm going to read it like I wrote it. God has stripped the archangel Satan of much of his supernatural ability. He has been pretty much limited to the things of the earth. He cannot just walk up and murder somebody. He has to have flesh to do it. The devil cannot accomplish his deeds of murdering and lying without doing it through fallen flesh. The body of man is the vessel of authority on earth for either kingdom. Did you get that? For either kingdom, man has authority on the earth. That is sovereign God. Okay? But you have to have a body from the earth to exercise authority here. And if you don't believe that, just try, just try exercising authority after you slip your body off and leave planet earth. John Walton is not giving direction for Walmart today. <laughs> Now, they may be reading things he wrote while he was on earth. They may be still using a lot of the principles, but he himself has lost that authority. You understand what I mean? Okay. Now, th because you have to have a body from planet earth for either kingdom, Satan's or God's, to, flow, to, to uh, work through, that's why Romans 12.1 is becoming the signature verse for revival for me. I know you know it by heart. Look it up anyway. Romans 12, 1. I, be I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. God is, this is one thing God cannot do because he will not violate your free will. By his grace, he forgave us through the blood of Jesus. By his grace, he made the new birth possible by the resurrection of Jesus. By his grace, he has rebirthed you and made you his own child. And Jesus' father is now your father. And by his grace, he delivered you out of darkness and brought you into the kingdom. I mean, God has done. These are the mercies that Paul is talking about here. All of the things that he, God has done. So... By the mercies of God, I beg you. Paul is begging. Beseech means beg. I beg you that you present your body a living sacrifice. Holy. Holy. And acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Well, it's real obvious to me that in the devil's kingdom of darkness... He's got nearly the whole world presenting their bodies a living sacrifice to him. Because he's sure getting his will done. See, Jesus just, me, he just mentioned murdering and lying in that verse. Go to Galatians 5, and you'll get a whole... No, no, no I don't mean to turn there right now. You guys are so obedient. <laughs> But later, you can stay. And there's a whole lot more than just murders and lies. It starts off adultery, fornication, concupiscence, all those things, witchcraft, which is really drug addiction, on drunkenness, revelings, murders, on and on and on it goes. And even that's not an exhaustive list. He said, and such like, meaning more stuff. <laughs> well, the, isn't the devil, isn't, isn't the whole world present, for, for the most part, now don't get me wrong, I, but for the most part, the world is presenting their bodies to the devil so that his works, all that stuff listed there, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, on and on and on, all of that is being accomplished. The deeds of their father they are doing. 
And it's his spirit working through their spirit, accomplishing his deeds on planet earth. Man, I said that good. But our reasonable service is to present our bodies holy and acceptable for the Father's use. And really, I should say the Lord Jesus Christ's use. Because it's through him. He is the connection. If you don't have that spirit of Christ, you're not connected with the Father. There's no flow. He can't pour through you unless Christ is in you. That's what he said, without me, you can do nothing. I am the vine. I am the connection. Right now, I'm a little boy, six years old again, standing out there looking at my grandpa shoemaker's grapevine. And it was an old grapevine. That gnarly looking trunk that came up out of the ground. I mean, of course, I'm remembering it as a six-year-old boy. And as I could not put both hands. I tried. I couldn't fit both hands around. You know, grapevines, most of them you've seen are small. But you, you get one that's been there for 20 years. And it's all gnarly and ancient looking coming up out of the ground there, you know. It's, and I couldn't, with both hands, I remember, I could not put my hands around that vine. It was that big. And it went on to me, seemed like forever. You go clear to the end. You get the grape, and these are those, you don't hardly see them anymore, those almost black Concord grapes. God, yeah, I don't know why they don't sell those in the store. Man, you bite into that thing, you just went to heaven. It's so sweet and juicy on a hot August day. Man. But you go clear to the end of that vine, and the fruit there was the same as the first fruit up close. It didn't diminish. Now, the source you can't see. The vine disappears into the ground. I can't see the source. You can't see the Father. You can sure taste the fruit. And the vine is the connection how the fruit gets here. Christ in you is your connection how the Father does the works through you. It's simple. It's not hard. Our part is so simple. What is it? Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. Then got to preach on me. I didn't intend to. Our reasonable service is to present our bodies holy and acceptable for his use. Now see, another thing he said in the rewind, I speak no unnecessary words to you. Why is the word acceptable in there? Because if you don't present it holy, it is not acceptable. How many of you think Jesus presented his body holy? And we say it all the time. Oh, Jesus is my pattern. Jesus is, he's, I'm pressing towards that mark. Yeah. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. He prayed, I prayed. He worshiped, I worshiped. He, 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 he loved the word, I loved the word. He kept his body under silence. <laughs> he kept his body under. God's waiting to hear. He presented his body holy. We wonder where revival is. I speak no unnecessary words to you. If acceptable is in that verse, and, and if words mean anything, presenting an unholy body is unacceptable. He cannot do that for us. See, that makes two things that I know for sure. Dave used to, remember when Dave was teaching us about private worship? And that phrase, if I can re bring it back, I'm rewinding now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. God says, I cannot, see, I cannot worship me through you for you. Now, God can pray literally through you. That's what praying in tongues is. God, the Holy Spirit, creates the prayer. God, the Holy Spirit's waiting to answer the prayer. And you're the turkey meat in the middle of that sandwich. All you got to do is let the, let the tongue flap. You're literally praying a prayer that God created. God, the Holy Ghost. Well, really, Jesus. But through his mind, the Holy Ghost got it. And you are literally praying God by your authority. See, they, again, we come to that authority. Why does he do it that way? The authority of your lips, your tongue. You've got a body on planet Earth. 
That's why it doesn't, somebody asked Dave a question, can I just think the tongues and not pray them? And Dave says, it does not say he that thinks in an unknown tongue. <laughs> no, you got to pray, you got to speak it, because that's where the authority is. You got to release that authority by speaking it. You can speak it softly, but you still got to speak it. Hmm. You're doing okay. The Christian. So let's, again, let's rewind a little bit. Go back to those thrilling days of yesteryear before you got saved. You outfit. Before you got born again, you did not have a little Adam running around in you. We all know that, right? We didn't have a little Adam running around in us. But did we have that nature? That fallen nature? So you did not have a little Adam running around in you, yet by the fallen nature of Adam, the devil was able to do many of his deeds through you. Now I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, not everybody murders. Not everybody commits adultery. I was thinking about that, but again, you know what the Bible says, before you're born again, there's none righteous, no, not one. So he gave me this sentence, and I bolded it. I like it. Not everybody does all the deeds. But everybody does some of the deeds. You may not have murdered, but you lied. You may not have committed adultery, but you stole a grape at a store one time. <laughs> a soda pop. Comic books when I was 14 from Walgreens. I, I've, I've already... I got caught, too. <laughs> we got honest people in this church. See, so we, we all know what it's like for the deeds. Okay, let's talk about Gary stealing the wall. Okay. I didn't steal Walgreens, but I stole comic books from Walgreens. Just slipping them under my shirt, you know. Thought I was so cool. I was 14 years old. Doing the deeds of the devil. Because the, he, he comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Well, stealing is definitely a work of the devil. So the deeds of my father I was doing. How was he doing that? Working through that sin nature on the inside of me. I was accomplishing the deeds of the devil by yielding to his nature that was in me. Okay? Not everybody does all the deeds, but everybody, before they get born again, they do some of the deeds. And you know what the law says? If you're guilty of just one little part, you're guilty of the whole thing. Okay? So again, Galatians 5 gives a really long list there. But see, now that you've been born again, you have been reconnected with God through the life of Christ that is in you. That new spirit, it's like the connector. If you had God, I'm doing this, if you had God the Father, on, I've got this drawing on a page. You've got God the Father in heaven on the left side, and then you've got the works of the Holy Ghost on earth being done on the right side. The flow, the connection between those two things is Christ in you. Christ in you. That's how the Father in heaven pours His Holy Spirit through Christ in you to be manifested on earth as the works of the Father with signs, wonders, miracles, and healings. And you've got almost nothing to do with that except present your body holy and believe the gospel. It's not by our works. Even Jesus said, Jesus of Nazareth, the man, said, it's the Father in me. But see, now I'm understanding more what it means. I, th I thought Jesus somehow was a container walking around with the Father. in the <laughs> And in a way that's right, but it's not really. It, it doesn't fit with the vine. See, I don't think heaven is a, is a planet. I think heaven is a, is a realm. I think it's a, maybe another dimension, whatever. I don't even know if it's that. But it's a realm so close. God is near. He is nearer than your breath. We have a song, something like that. He's, he's, he's like, for those who can't see me, I got my hand right up like an inch off my face. God is here. It's a in Him we live and move and have our being. But there's a, the Spirit of, let's just call it the realm of the Spirit. We can, we can do that, right? God lives in the realm of the Spirit, whatever that is. The connection from that realm to planet Earth is the Spirit of Christ in you. And that's how he pours the Holy Spirit through Christ in you 
to manifest the works on planet earth. It's just getting so simple to me. What does he need from Gary? Gary, I beg you. Present your body. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto the Lord. And the, the next verse. Be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, there's, there's a blockage in the pipe. <laughs> right? There's a blockage in the, in, the, in the flow. Let's go way back. If Gary still believes, like I was trained in, in a denominational church, if Gary still believed that God does not heal today, don't you think that will put a block in the pipe? If Gary thinks tongues is not for today, won't that put a block in the pipe? If, 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 if. I could just go on and on and on, see? That's why those two things are connected. Our part is to present our body and to renew our mind. How, 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 do, you, <laughs> how do you renew your mind? <laughs> how do you renew your mind? Well, it's not just the Word. God didn't just give us the Word. Thank God He gave us the Word. But it's, He gave us a book and a teacher. And he plainly said, it's the Holy Spirit who's going to lead you, born-again Christian, into all truth. Thank God again for Pastor Dave Roberson, who taught us, taught us the benefit of sitting there during those boring hours, praying in other tongues, where just, and the devil shouting in your ear, you're wasting your time. Nothing is happening. You're not changing. You're the same old dirt bag you was before. Oh, that's what he says to me. Telling you. I love it. I love it. I love it. Re I love real people. You're the same. Somebody related to that. <laughs> same old dirt bag you was before. Well, that's the devil. You're not the same old dirt bag. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He... We, I say it again, we literally are his hope in the earth. He's hoping we come to the understanding of this. No wonder he's given us this blueprint for 2020. Pray these mysteries. Let my spirit bring it to you where you understand it so you can walk in it. Because we're coming into a revival like it's not been seen since the book of Acts. And I'm beginning to see now it's going to be bigger than the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts in our, for our dispensation is the early rain. But he says at the end, I'm going to combine the early rain with the latter rain. Now that tells me that's going to be bigger than the first one. Four minutes. <laughs> now that you've been born again, you've been reconnected with God through the life of Christ within you. You don't have a little Jesus running around inside of you either, just like you didn't have a little Adam before. But that new spirit, that born-again spirit, is the connection. It is the life of Christ in you. That is the vine through which the Father can pour out His Spirit so that out of your belly, your core, your spirit can flow the rivers of living water. And it begins with tongues. It does for everybody that gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. But He intends for it to manifest in miracles, signs, and wonders the same fruit that Jesus produced. The seed. He rewind. I hope you're not in too much trouble, Alan. I'm not done yet. We're getting... He asked me years ago. Yeah, I think I was still in the trucks. He said, have you ever seen a seed on planet Earth? Any kind. Well, you take that seed. And you put it in the ground. And you water it. And tend it. And watch it grow. And the end result of that seed is just one seed again. He said, have you ever seen a plant like that? And I went, no. He said, then you never will. Because that's not God's plan. It's never been God's plan. God plants one seed. And from that seed, you obtain many seeds. My father planted a single apple seed. Now it's probably been over 40 years ago up here in, uh, in around Grand Lake, the house where they lived. That tree produced, it, it has been producing apples for decades. 
it produces so many apples every year that you have to, we used to have to take two by fours and two by sixes to prop under the limbs because they would literally break off the tree. Same thing with pears. He has a pear tree that does like that too. Now, from one seed, you just take one harvest year, just one harvest. I'm just guessing. 200 apples? How many seeds are in each apple? Six? One harvest. Well, second year, third year, fourth year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. How many seeds from one? And get this, each seed able to do what the first one did. I run out of English right there. Glory to God. Hmm. Our job is to get out of his way. The flow must not be hindered by an unrenewed mind. The flow must not be unhindered by unholy flesh. I should have added this one. The flow cannot be hindered by unforgiveness. Many Christians have cleansed themselves pretty well from many of the things of the flesh like drugs and alcohol and sexual immorality. But unforgiveness is rampant in the body of Christ. I'm telling you, there's nothing that has been done that the Holy Spirit will not be able to work forgiveness through you if you'll let him. Hear him, obey him. He'll work. You'll, you'll be amazed at the forgiveness you can really walk in. Now, when Jesus had his own body for those three and a half years on planet Earth, he kept it under the dominion of his spirit. That's why he, he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. But he did it with the same new nature you have. He did not have something that he didn't give us. Okay? We've had teaching for years on that. So Jesus presented his body, body holy and acceptable so that the fathers could flow through him unhindered through that spirit turn to 1 Corinthians 9 I'm almost done 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24 and Paul is using a very simple analogy here He's using the analogy of athletes that train for the Olympic games okay have you ever seen athletes train for the Olympics now these are not just people at planet fitness I mean <laughs> This is not like Gary on, on the incline machine, you know, on the, the, the treadmill on an incline of three, you know, walking real slow. That's not training for the Olympic Games. That's trying to stay alive now. <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing a little bit. But you see them train for the Olympic Games? I mean, it's almost beyond the limits of any physical endurance. They press themselves to where beyond where you can go so they can go there. <laughs> so he uses that analogy. Verse 24, know you not that they which run in a race run all, but now notice, one receives the prize. Not everybody receives the prize. Did you get that? But he tells each one of us, run so that you can obtain. In this race, each of us can receive the prize. See? Isn't that what he says? So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery, he's again using the analogy of the Olympic Games, is temperate, self-control in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. You know, gold medal, something like that. But we, an incorruptible. Now he brings it to him himself. I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that just beat in the air. I like to put in there shadow boxing. Not as one that, for no reason. But I, here's what he's talking about. But I keep under my body. And I bring it, I bring it. By the dominion I've been given, by the, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, by the same light of life that he walked in, I'm walking in it. And I'll bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So I wrote here in all caps, run, that you may obtain the prize, church. Run. 
Run that you may obtain the prize wherever you are around the world that's connected with this. Run that you may obtain the prize. What is the prize we're running after? We're so blessed here to know what our goal is. We're so blessed at this church to know what the prize is we're pressing toward. It is a supernatural outpouring of revival like the world has not seen since the book of Acts. We know what it is. And part of running that race is to keep our body under so we can present it holy and acceptable for the Father's use. I'm going to end this with a quote from the blueprint for 2020. No wonder in the blueprint, the Holy Spirit said, the revival we are contending for, no man, it means no man or woman, can achieve in the earth without prayer and fasting and the word and the deep things of his spirit. Jesus said in our dispensation, and boy, I'm seeing it, See, it wasn't necessary that the disciples fast while he was here. Because God had a body he was working through. It was his body. But Jesus says, now when I'm not here, meaning, it's said another way, when I don't have my own body on planet earth, then my disciples, they will fast. They will fast. 